of Napa Valley Wine Library Association. We'd like to welcome you to our second virtual program. This is our 30th wine seminar. And at this program, we're devoted to wineries and vineyards that were planted at least 50 years ago. Of course, this day, um, the Italian Open is being run on Roman red clay. The Pre Preakness in Baltimore on the Pimlico track will be run on Sandy Loam. Here in Napa Valley, we have over 30 choices of soil, soil types. So you can imagine the different numbers of grounds that these vines are springing from that will put the wine in your glass. We're going to be led through a number of vineyards and wines with Tegan Paslakwa, who was our moderator for our um, last held wine seminar. The one in 2020 had to be postponed for obvious reasons. So we're happy to have in 2021, this old vine seminar and the privilege of sharing it with you all. We're going to have a certain amount of time with each of our presenters. And I am able to suggest the chat room for questions as they occur to you throughout the program. So without any hesitation, I am pleased to invite the winemaker for Turley Wine Cellars and a special bottling that is done for the Napa Valley Wine Library of that Petite Syrah. Tegan Pasolacqua. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I would like to introduce our star-studded group uh, that we're, we're fortunate enough to have join us. And first, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Kelly White. Some of you may know Kelly White. She is a sommelier, an author, a, uh, <clears throat> a educator, a vintner, and most currently titled a mother. And she's joining us to give a historical perspective on Napa Valley wine growing. And Kelly also is the author of uh, Napa Valley Then and Now, which is a 255 page book that tells the story of Napa Valley wine then and now. Her and her husband also ran Leslie Rudd's wine program at Press, which basically bought, brought old Napa Valley wines to the forefront of the conversation, I would say, on in the global uh, scene. <clears throat> so thank you, Kelly, for joining us. She's going to give us an introduction in a little bit, but then I wanted to run through all the other speakers. The first one will be Mike Herbie, and Mike Herbie is the winemaker in, in a joint venture with his wife, uh, and the winery is called Relic. And he started that in 2001. He worked at Barron's and Hitchcock. He was the first winemaker at Realm. And he consults for another a, a group of star-studded wineries throughout Napa Valley. And he and his wife actually have their own winery that they built in Cave that you'll see in his background up on Soda Canyon. Uh, he, he will be presenting the Frediani Vineyard uh, Carignan. <clears throat> Next up will be a friend of Ours, Bob Bialy, who is a Napa Valley native. He started uh, driving a tractor at seven. And in 1991, he convinced a friend and his father to start bottling wine from the family's vineyard that was labeled Aldo's Vineyard. And that is in the Oak Knoll district. And I believe it's the only vineyard that's left in the city limits of Napa. Is that right, Bob? Uh, Oh, I forgot. He's muted. So uh, he, we will get into that when we chat to him. So now they produce over 24 different wines at Bialy, all starting from the original 400 case Aldo's blend. Uh, I will then present the Haynes Zinfandel that's made at Turley Wine Cellars. It's a vineyard that Turley has worked with since its inception in 1993, uh, planted by the Bourne family in 1902 and 1903. And it's a mixed Zinfandel planning <clears throat> uh, that's basically in a really neat spot of Napa Valley in St. Helena, which we will have a couple other wines from that area. <clears throat> Next up will be Morgan Twain Peterson. And Morgan is the father of Joel Peterson. Uh, 
I think he's heard the opposite, but Morgan also is a new father of a son named Joel Peterson, who Morgan is also the son of Joel Peterson, the founder of Ravenswood. Morgan grew up at his family's winery and actually made his first wine at age five, uh, uh, Pinot Noir, no less, from the San Giacomo Vineyard. It had a little cult following on the East Coast and it was sold. And then Morgan, after graduating college, he moved home and worked harvest with his father and then started traveling the world working harvest throughout Australia and Bordeaux, coming back home to Sonoma Valley to start his own brand in 2007. And it only took him 10 years, but 10 years later, he was able to get this little title called Master of Wine. So something that I think everyone in California is very proud of him for achieving. And <clears throat> he will present the Oakville Farmhouse Vineyard, the last old vine vineyard, true old vine vineyard left in, uh, there's a couple other little blocks, but in the Oakville ABA, it's right uh, below the Harlan Estate. And it's a just a true jewel of Napa Valley, but also Morgan will get into it. It also tells a story about Oakville and great varieties in Napa Valley. And then we're going to finish the seminar with Rosemary Cakebread. Rosemary, who <clears throat> uh, is very well known and respected throughout the Napa Valley and beyond. She started her own brand in 2007 called Gallica after a long stint as the winemaker at Spotswood and her vineyard, estate vineyard, and the wine we'll be tasting that is part of the estate now, a Petit Syrah vineyard dating to the 50s, uh, is in that same stretch where the Spotswood wines that she made for so long come from. Uh, she also was able to work at Inglenook for a long period, and she has some experience making old vines throughout Napa Valley as well, but the, the uh, Petit Syrah from her estate vineyard is her first own bottling of Old Vine Vineyard. So that kind of rounds out the, the folks in the seminar. I think everyone's going to be thoroughly impressed with the wines and the people. I'd like to also say thank you to all the folks who came and picked up their wine kits yesterday. It was a real treat to see so many faces, truly faces, masked and unmasked at the winery. It was a real treat and it really made my week. So thank you everyone who came and picked up their wine. And without further ado, I think we should invite Kelly White up to give us a, a history of wine growing in the Napa Valley. Thank you, Tegan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to speak today. And thank you to Diana and Rick and the Napa Valley Wine Library for doing these. Um, they're really fun and I think so valuable. And it's wonderful to see so many people here in this room. Um, so Tegan asked me to give kind of a run through to set the stage um, as far as just an overarching viticultural history of California and, and Napa Valley. Um, so obviously that's a lot of period of time because California has a much deeper and longer wine growing history, I think, than many consumers uh, are aware. Probably everybody on this call today is aware. Um, so we're going to take, you know, what? to 250 years of grape growing and condense it down into 10 minutes. So it's gonna be kind of like a speed dating um, through Napa Valley's history um, and through California's history. So, um, so I'm gonna dive right in, but please, you know, if anybody has any questions or if I'm going too fast or glossing over anything, raise your hand, throw something up in the chat. And uh, I definitely don't wanna to leave anybody behind, but I, we are gonna cover a lot of ground. Um, so just to start, um, and uh, apologies if everyone already knows this, but as far as fine wine making in California, uh, when we're talking about fine wine in California, we're talking about a very specific grapevine species called Vitis vinifera. Um, so obviously uh, grapes are native to the United States. In fact, most grapevines around the world are now planted on American rootstocks. Um, but when the various kind of colonizing forces of Europe started to come into the United States, um, those native grape varieties were kind of quickly deemed unsuitable for fine wine production. And you started to see some vinifera come into the country. Um, and that came via a variety of mechanisms on the East Coast, the French and the English brought in some things up in the North. Actually, even there was some Russian uh, influence. But when you're talking about California, 
you're really talking about the Spanish. And so the Spanish um, would go from Spain to generally the Canary Islands, um, and then their sort of path, uh, their conquering path was South America up to Central America, then into Mexico, and then kind of up the West Coast to the United States. And they were um, Catholic missionaries, and so they brought um, one very specific grapevine, um, which is his official name is Liston Prieto, um, and they would plant a vineyard at each mission and as they moved the frontier northward, um, they would establish a mission, plant a vineyard, and that would create sacramental wine. They got about as far north as um, Sonoma is really the last one um, before, you know, things kind of changed and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but this grape variety list on Prieto is now effectively extinct in, uh, in um, continental Spain. You do still see it in the Canary Islands. And of course, it's a major grape uh, in South America still. Um, here, because of its affiliation with the missions, uh, it became known as Mission. And so the earliest vineyards in California were pretty much exclusively mission variety, including the first uh, vineyard in Napa Valley that George Yant established um, in the winter of 38, 39. And um, so, so mission variety was, was here. Um, and then a, some variety, a variety of things happened um, that kind of changed the landscape here. Um, one of the big ones was that in 1821, California came under the jurisdiction of Mexico. And then in the 1830s, Mexico started secularizing these missions. And so what that means is it took grape growing away from the sole dominion of the clergy, kind of released it to um, the general population. So you could, you, homesteaders, um, et cetera, were starting to make their own wine and it opened the door to commercialization and the beginnings of the wine industry. Um, the Mexican-American War lasted from 1846 to 1848, and at its conclusion, um, California became a uh, part of the United States, and almost simultaneously, gold was discovered in the Sierra foothills. So the San Francisco 49ers, as you, as probably everybody here knows, is named after the gold rush that began in 1849. Uh, and the gold rush really uh, transformed the state of California, especially from a population dynamics standpoint. Uh, this idea that you might kind of suddenly strike it rich um, was infectious. It brought people from all over the world. Um, from, from there, we had a lot of Chinese laborers. We had people coming from the East Coast of the United States, which back then, this is the transcontinental railroad wouldn't be finished until the 1860s. So we're talking about horse-drawn carriage over the Rockies, not a small trek. Uh, and then also a lot of European um, people came to California at that time, hoping to strike it rich if and when they didn't, and statistically they did not. Um, oftentimes they either didn't wanna go home or didn't have the money to go home. And it was again, quite an arduous journey at that time. And so people stayed and fell back on their old professions. And this is part of the reason why um, the beginnings of the California wine industry in the 1850s and 60s was so relatively successful and um, was so influenced by European wine growing traditions because there were actual European wine growers and winemakers um, here and bringing their things that they knew with them, their traditions with them. Um, so I can tell you that, um, you know, during this time as this wine industry is starting to grow and build and get more successful and it was incredibly successful by the 1880s, um, remarkable number of wineries. I think in the 1880s, there was over 100 wineries just in Napa Valley alone. Um, and just to kind of bury the lead a bit, a little bit, we wouldn't get back to that number of wineries again after Prohibition until the 1980s. So it would take 100 years to recover the success of that decade it, just in Napa Valley alone. But as the wine industry was swelling and growing and people were coming and starting wineries, um, you started to see different types of vinifera being brought in. And sometimes they were brought into the East Coast and grown in hot houses and then kind of moved over as a big part of like the, the, the taxonomy and horticultural movements of the time, or just directly imported into the West Coast. And there's a lot of scholarship around, you know, finding the individual pathways that each particular grapevine took and you can get really nerdy about it. But the thing to know is that, you know, during this time, there was a lot of experimentation um, and a lot of kind of interesting plantings going on. So um, 
some of the early successes, speaking specifically about Napa Valley, which is kind of the part of California that I know the best, um, were Riesling-based uh, whites and Zinfandel-based reds, um, were some of the earliest, most uh, wines to receive praise and to win tasting competitions and the like. Um, but you also saw things like Cabernet Sauvignon starting to get a little bit of traction during this time, but really everything. And, you know, even though there was a lot of quality wine being made and a lot of enthusiasm, it was very chaotic. There wasn't necessarily yet a really good understanding of what grape varieties should be grown, where each vineyard, each property was kind of its own little kingdom. And, you know, what was planted there was very much dependent on kind of what the owner wanted, wanted to plant. And usually it was a little bit of everything. Um, so there were some scholars working at the time that were trying to organize this, but for the most part, it was a little bit crazy. Um, but things got a little very pared down and very kind of, in a sense, um, forcibly organized during prohibition. Um, so the big successful wine industry of the 1880s started to really get, take a couple of, take some serious knocks, um, starting in the 1890s. A lot of things were going on. We had massive economic depression in the United States. Um, we had phylloxera, uh, come tearing through California. So I mentioned that almost all the grapevines around the world are planted on American rootstocks now. That's because of phylloxera, which is a kind of vine nibbling louse that can open the door to diseases and things that eventually will take down um, and destroy most vines, most vinifera vines. Um, that raged across Europe and other various parts of the world before it was solved for in grafting on to resistant rootstocks, which were generally American in origin. So California was not immune prior to the, the 1890s phylloxera infestation, everything was planted on its own roots. Um, and so that obviously had to change, but before that could change, there was mass um, destruction of the vineyards in, a, across the state. And then of course you had the beginnings of the temperance movement that led to prohibition. So I'm not gonna talk too much about prohibition. I think we all know what it was and when it was and what it did. But um, while it completely effectively stopped the wine production in the state for the most part, um, it had a kind of an interesting alternative effect in the vineyards. So in the legislation of prohibition, there was effectively a kind of look the other way clause that allowed the head of every household in the United States to produce 200 gallons of quote, non-intoxicating fruit juice a year. But obviously whether it was intoxicating or not is not something that was enforced uh, enforceable um, from a policing standpoint. So it became effectively a license to make home wine. And so home winemaking became incredibly popular all around the country. Um, seemingly overnight, uh, the demand for wine grapes skyrocketed and carloads were shipped to all corners of the United States. Um, and if you think back to what it must have been like at this time, for the most part, we're talking about very long journeys and unrefrigerated rail cars. And so it was quickly sort of discovered that only certain varieties were really suitable to this kind of journey and could land in Boston, um, you know, in a state to make tasty wine. Um, and those um, varieties, you know, became known as shipper varieties um, for this very reason. So you really see during this time, all of that variation and all of that experimentation um, with a variety of vinifera grapevines go away and get replaced by some very specific um, set of varieties. So I have a statistic here that I think is really interesting. So by 1926, um, which is right in the middle of prohibition, 1919 to 1933, um, the composition of Napa's vineyards was 40% Alicante Boucher, 30% Petite Syrah, 16% Zinfandel, and 13% Carignan. So that's, you know, that's quite a dramatic change. Um, and that's pretty interesting. And we're going to talk about the, the winemakers on the panel today. We'll talk about those specific grape varieties in relation to their specific wines. But the characteristic that they all shared um, they all brought a little something different to the blend and that kind of bouquet of grape varieties, the ratios would change depending on climactically and culturally where you were in the state of the California. But for the most part, they were known as shipper varieties or, or mixed black vineyards and they would be planted together, often interplanted. Um, and they were just 
dark colored, full flavored, sturdy, high producing, et cetera. They have a different selection of qualities that made them ideal for this journey across the country um, into the bathtubs and toilet bowls of home winemakers um, around the country. So, and, and this really was, it sounds like a niche activity, but it was so popular that area under vine in, Cal in many parts of California actually increased during the 1920s. So at a time when you could not legally make and sell wine for the most part, area under grapevine was increasing. So it's kind of, kind of fascinating. Um, prohibition of course did not last forever. It did last long enough to sever many of the traditions that we had established. A lot of our European winemakers either died or went home or did something else, uh, got out of the game. And so uh, when prohibition was repealed, the industry was in a very sorry state. It would take a very long time to recover. Um, it repealed in, in 1933, which is also famous of being in the middle of the Great Depression. So um, that financially, once again, the United States was just really not in a position to be investing in the production of what even back then was something of a, of a luxury item. Um, and so the winers took a very, very, very long time to, to recover. There were also cultural reasons why um, things were slow to change and also um, uh, sanitate, we had issues with sanitation in the winers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The thing to know, to yada, yada, yada my way through the history here is that things really started to change again um, in the 1960s. In the 1960s, there was a slow build up to a rebirth in the California wine industry that really is widely agreed upon to have really taken hold in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, we start seeing more Americans drink wine, more Americans drink dry wine. The 1967 is the first year that dry wine consumption beat sweet wine consumption in the United States. So, um, so that's something and that had big effects um, on the California wine industry. And, um, but the, but what, so, but the industry that was kind of remaking itself in the 1960s looked very different than what had come before. So not just in terms of the wines themselves, but also in terms of the farming. So the old vines um, from Prohibition and prior, generally speaking, in California were planted in what would be called a California sprawl. I'm sure Tegan and the, uh, and the guys and Rosemary will get more technical in, uh, in terms of how you describe that sort of trellising. But the basic idea is that they were spaced widely apart, both to accommodate either horse-drawn plows or early large tractors, um, but also to reduce competition of resources and water in a dry Mediterranean climate because because drip irrigation wasn't introduced to California until the 1970s. So these vineyards were generally being dry farmed or irrigated in some sort of you know, crude, more crude way. Um, so to avoid competition, they'd be spaced very far apart. They were trained in these sort of bush shapes, right? So low to the ground, kind of sprawly, no trellising wires, um, lots of shade on the fruit, uh, et cetera. So they looked very, very different. Um, when California started to wake up in the 1960s, um, a different sort of farming started to take hold. So you started to see here now those varieties going out of fashion and new, not new, but specifically French and uh, in, in Napa Valley, specifically Bordeaux varieties, really start to take hold and become the thing to plant and the thing to grow. And then, and then in the 1970s, when drip irrigation came to Napa Valley that accelerated because these grape varieties, the Bordeaux grape varieties, the Burgundy grape varieties, they're generally not as drought tolerant as the, the shipper varieties that had taken hold um, so completely during prohibition. And they just needed a little bit more input. Um, and, and also you would see modern Bordeaux style farming um, take over. So you started to see instead of these bushes widely spaced, um, you'd see rows of vines on wires um, with the fruiting zones trained in a kind of a line. And that was very interesting, also changed the style of wine um, in a way that is still kind of what we're dealing with today. Um, but, and yet, even though they had these changes going, California was still finding itself. There was still a lot of experimentation. There was still a lot of this and that grown and all together in a mishmash. Um, 
and um, not everything was for the best. In the 1980s, Chardonnay was the most widely planted grape in Napa Valley. So I think a lot of people today associate Napa Valley so closely with Cabernet Sauvignon, it's almost one word. But Cabernet Sauvignon didn't really take the lead statistically in, in Napa Valley until 1992. There were a couple of years in the 70s where it was the most dominant grape, but really we're talking about 1992 and forward. Um, what catalyzed that change was that phylloxera came back to California. Um, so a lot of the growth that was happening in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, in California was on a rootstock called AXR1, which there's a couple of different theories going around, but I think, and I'd love to hear from the panelists if they have thoughts on this, but I believe ultimately it was just decided, it was insufficiently resistant to phylloxera. And so you started to see signs of decline the industry was really in denial, but by the sometime in the 1980s, at some point, the writing was on the wall, and there was a general understanding that a lot of California vineyards would need to be um, replanted again, um, which was an incredibly costly endeavor. Um, and this is where you really see, again, for cultural reasons, um, a new commitment and a new alignment in Napa Valley, at least, to Bordeaux, Bordeaux grape varieties, and modern Bordeaux style farming. Um, and that has to do with just kind of cultural movements in the United States, Francophilia, and also a renewed interest in red wine. So this is a kind of funny cultural moment in the United States that I think we forget about, but it had massive impact on consumer um, trends and practices, which was that in 1991, the old 60 Minutes, uh, 60 Minutes came out with a show on the French paradox that basically asked the question, French people eat so much cheese, how are they not dead? <laughs> and the answer was red wine. Um, and so red wine suddenly became the thing to drink, whereas in the 1980s, um, the industry of the dry wine industry was very much driven by white wine. So you had that kind of cultural shift at the same moment when you had the sort of etch-a-sketch of California vineyards being shaken clean um, once again. And that's uh, how you ended up with that uh, transformation. Um, but interestingly, old vine vineyards, the old shipper varieties um, from the prohibition days were obviously, uh, were not planted for the most part on AXR1. They were generally on either St. George rootstock or some other kind of rootstock or in certain parts of California still own rooted. Um, so they were immune to the AXR1 shakedown of the 1980s. And so they have lived to tell their tale. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's old vines is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, not only is it kind of romantic and wonderful to see these old vineyards, but I think I kind of fell in love with them from the wines that they produce. And I think the wines we're going to try today are really extraordinary wines. Um, not only are they just qualitatively very interesting um, and different from what is now considered the California norm, but I think they also speak to this wonderful, deep, and sometimes forgotten history of California viticulture. Um, but they are a depleting resource, right? They are an endangered species in some regards, and they do need your support, both the wines, the people behind them, um, and the grape growers, because there is a lot of economic pressure um, on grape growers in California, and especially in Napa Valley, to replace old vines that might be less fashionable varieties and certainly less high yielding with higher yielding, more fashionable varieties, AKA Cabernet Sauvignon or Pinot Noir or something like that. Um, so the wines you're drinking are not just great wines, but I think they're also historical treasures and philosophical statements um, in a glass. And um, I'm very excited to taste through them and I hope you guys enjoy the tasting. Tegan, I'll hand it back to you unless there's anything that I have forgotten. <laughs> no, that is perfect. Thank you so much, Kelly. <clears throat> so I think we should get going. And if, if everyone who has the tasting kit wants to start, if they already haven't, start tasting through the wines. <clears throat> and also there was an envelope in the bags that has the lineup with the picture of the label and the a vine from the vineyard. And it gives you a rundown of what we're going to taste, alcohol, production numbers, kind of who, who we're talking to if, if, you, if you need a reminder. So we're going to start with uh, Mike Herbie, uh, Relic Wine Cellars. Uh, he's the proprietor and winemaker. He has a label that's called Archive that focuses on 
some old vine plantings and we're going to taste his Calistoga Carignan from the Frediani Vineyard. And I wanted to first ask Mike, how did you meet Al Frediani? I, uh, that's a great question. Thank you for having us. Uh, we really appreciate being part of this. Uh, I just want to say that first of all. Um, I actually met Al through his nephew, uh, Jim Frediani, who has the, the greater Frediani Vineyards, uh, which is an amalgam of about 100 acres on either side of uh, Silverado Trail, right at Pickett Road in Calistoga. And, uh, and I went up to look at Jim's Grenache and he didn't have any for sale, but I was on the hunt for, for Grenache and uh, gave me a tour of the vineyard. And he said, I don't have any Grenache, but you know, my uncle has some Petit Syrah. And I was like, oh, where's, where does your uncle live? Where's that vineyard? And he said, at the end of Pickett Road, you know, right past Isley Vineyard. <laughs> and I just thought, okay, I'm not really that interested in making Petit Syrah, but I have to meet this guy. And, and Jim said, I'm gonna see my uncle in three weeks at a family reunion. And I'll tell him to give you a call. And I just thought, okay, this is never going to happen. But about, about a month later, I got a call from Alfred. And he asked me if I wanted to come look at his pets. And uh, that's, what, that's how I met him. So I went out to look at it. And uh, I never really thought I would make Petit Syrah. But it was on extremely gravelly Cortina soils on a hillside right at the foot of uh, Simmons Canyon. And uh, he also happened to have some Carignan that was about 110 years old at the time. And uh, that's how uh, we have what we have in the glass in front of us. And so did you start making, what year was this? This was in 2009. Okay. And did you start making the Zinfant or the Petit Syrah and the Carignan the same year? I did. Yeah. Okay. Well, t tell us about the Carignan. I know it's, a, it's, it's not a huge part of the plantation there. And as you mentioned, it is next to the Isla Vineyard. I mean, hollowed ground in Napa Valley, right? I mean, it, it's a pretty special place to, to grow grapes. Tell us about the Carignan planting. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I was, I was really surprised that it was even there. I mean, as we all know, there's, there are very few acres of Carignan there. Um, and there are two blocks of Carignan at Alfred's Vineyard. Um, and one is contiguous with the creek, essentially. And it's, uh, it's about an acre, uh, probably right next to a mixed block. Um, that's interplanted. And then the block that this comes from is actually a fence row. Um, until two years ago, it was effectively cordon trained on barbed wire. Uh, the only vineyard I've ever seen cordon trained on. <laughs> uh, real hazard for the pickers, uh, but they make it around it. Uh, Al's son, Steve, Al passed away a couple of years ago and uh, at the age of 97. And uh, Al's son, Steve, has taken over. He took the barbed wire out of there, I think, for safety reasons. But... <laughs> It's effectively a fence row, um, so it does not have uh, any competition on the roadside. It's right along the road. So if you drive past Isley Vineyard and you see some gnarly vines right on the road, that's, what, that's where this comes from. Um, and then it's probably a good, there's an avenue on the other side before the main blocks uh, of Petit Syrah. And uh, so it's probably about 15 feet until you hit the other vines. So the vines, uh, we, as we understand, were planted right around 1900. Uh, Al's family was living in San Francisco, his father, and um, after the San Francisco earthquake moved up in 1906, 1907, and bought the property. Um, Al told me that he, his understanding was that the vines were already planted at that point, but were probably young vines was his understanding. They are on St. George, so you know that makes sense somewhere right around 1900. Uh, they're head trained. Uh, they are organically farmed. They've always been organically farmed. Um, no Roundup or any chemicals have ever been sprayed on this vineyard. In fact, the only thing that ever really touches it is, is uh, sulfur dust. That's it. Um, it's dry farmed and uh, head trained. And um, the yields are not exactly low, I think, because the vines don't have competition, uh, much competition on either side. So the vines are big. Uh, berry size is not tiny. Um, you know, the vines are doing well. They're healthy and uh, they ripen the fruit no problem. Well, and what I love about that part of the Frediani Vineyard and as a whole, I mean, I bring a lot of people who want to come do the Napa Valley experience, sommeliers, friends in the wine business. And when you drive down and you show them Isley and then you show them, you know, Al's Vineyard, I mean, people's kind of jaws drop. They, I mean, I think a lot of people don't know that that still exists in Napa Valley and in such special, special ground. So it's a really 
real treat to taste this wine and drink it. Can you tell us how you made it? I know you kind of took some, you know, some different techniques than you usually use for your other wines. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think that this, this block, especially maybe because it doesn't have so much competition really needs, needs the stems. And so, uh, we and can you explain to everyone what, what you mean by that? <clears throat> what the stems? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So we ferment this with the, with the clusters entirely complete, right. W with the stems as well, um, during maceration. So it's a fairly standard maceration about two weeks and, um, we foot stomp the grapes, um, after they're sorted in an open top small fermenter and um, fermented with the with the grapes and the stems as well. And the stems, you know, uh, offer a lot of complexity, some extra phenolics, uh, mid palate, uh, you know, more exotic aromatics. And, uh, you know, the first year that we started going 100% on the whole cluster of the wine just really kind of came into its own. And uh, it's been we've been making it that way for 10 years now. Awesome. It's Fantastic. I wish there were more wines made like this in Napa Valley. Anything else you want to add about the vineyard or the, the experience working with the that's part of the world? I know you, you still get grapes from Kennefick Ranch or did you ever get yeah. uh, from a block essentially right across the street uh, from this. So it's about and maybe 50. can you compare and contrast that with the wine you make from the old vines at all or yeah. are there similarities differences? You know, it's, in, it's an interesting part. I, I'm a big fan of, of all the terroir along Pickett Road. You know, it's some of the youngest soil in Napa Valley. Um, and, you know, essentially it's all just scree and deposits of decomposed rock, you know, that have come out of Simmons Canyon and formed really deep deposits with no noticeable or notable clay lens. Water table is at somewhere around 160 to 180 feet. And so there's a real similarity, I think, in all the vineyards along the road of course, you know, the alluvial fan creates finer and finer gravel deposits as you get closer to Silverado Trail. Um, the soil here and the soil in our block in Kennefick, you know, is, is pretty crude. You know, the rocks are tumbled as you get closer to the creek, but a lot of uh, just fractured volcanics. And what I think that brings is I think it brings a really strong sense of terroir to all the wines. So our winemaking for the Cabernet that we make from Kennefick Ranch, which is called Artifact, is quite different than this. It's is destemmed entirely. Um, it's aged in 100% new oak, where this is all in neutral French oak barriques. Uh, but I think that there is a signature to that area. There's sort of a dried rosemary, thyme, um, and sort of minerality that that you get across grape varieties. And we work with a lot of different grapes, sort of in this on this alluvial fan. We work with Charbonneau. We work with Grenache at uh, Jim Frediani's vineyard. We work with Cabernet, Cabernet Franc from Jim Frediani, the Petit Sirah and the Carignan at Al's. And then we also do a mixed uh, block field blend that we make one or two barrels of every year uh, from Alfred Frediani from his only mixed block, which is adjacent to the Carignan. Um, and there's just, I think we look for vineyards that have that sense of place and the distinct uh, terroir impression uh, rather than just looking for, you know, the fruit. So I'm fascinated with the area. Um, and a lot of different things can be made there, but I think there's a real signature. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoy the wine and I think everyone else out there will. And I think it's, it's neat. I mean, there's very little old vine Carignan planted left in Napa Valley. And it was yeah. something that kind of definitely helped to build Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. John, one of the things Kelly said when she talked about the shipping varieties, even though the percentages, I mean, varieties like Carignan and Alicante were producers too. I mean, they, they weren't just <clears throat> planted in high acreage numbers. They were actually, you know, about twice as productive of, as things like Zinfandel and Petit Syrah at the time. So um, it's a real treat. So thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Mr. Bob Bialy. Uh, Bob, are you out there? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, sir. <laughs> Mr. Bob, so give me, give me the rundown. So tell us about when your family bought this property. And um, <laughs> intro to grape growing in Apple Valley. In 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 this particular one, um, we didn't we actually didn't purchase it. Uh, my grandmother traded it for a, a prune orchard across the creek in 1962, and so it was a straight across swap. She owned um, uh, a prune orchard uh, right there at the northern end of Bel Air, um, you know the subdivision. Right. Fifteen acres there, and uh, she. 
in, in a way kind of coveted the vineyard <laughs> across the creek. Uh, she had plenty of prunes and she wanted more grapes. And, and so the developer at the time uh, approached uh, my grandmother and said, look, we'd like to, like to purchase your prune orchard here and continue our, our, uh, our development. And she goes, well, you know, I, I really don't want to sell to you. I'd rather, I'd rather have um, that vineyard across the creek. And he said, all right, I'll take care of that. <laughs> and so was they that the Vita? Uh, no, it, no, it was just a, a private guy. Oh, a you mean the, grow, the, the, the developer. developer? Yeah. No, it, it wasn't. He was across the, the western side of um, uh, the highway. It was just an, uh, another developer. And the and grower family, was just a... Sorry, your sorry. family had a vineyard at the time though, right? Or no? Uh, yes, we had right. a vineyard um, uh, planted in 1937 also. It was the first vineyard that my grandfather had planted. Um, that was next to the house, which was about a, I don't know, like 75 yards away from, from this one. Right. And, uh, but it was much smaller. It was only like two acres. And this one, um, you know, six acres. It's not a lot, not a lot larger, but it, um, but more than, than what she had and she wanted it. And it was in really good condition and it was planted at the same time. And so she had watched it, you know, being farmed and whatnot. And it was really in its prime. It was like 30 years old and it was really pumping a lot of fruit. <laughs> and so she... She thought, for crying out loud, I'd like to have it. So anyway, uh, they traded right straight across, no money exchanged, and um, she was happy as a clam. And we still have it. And it's right there on the corner of El Central and Jefferson Street. And, and was we, I correct that it's one of, if not one of the last vineyards in the city of Napa? Well, it, it's, well that's what we say, and it must be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I suppose, except for some backyard vineyards, that's, uh, right. it, it definitely is, you know, the the biggest commercial vineyard in the city, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I really and, appreciated, sorry, go ahead. Can, can you tell, can you explain to everyone, because Kelly touched on it in her intro, how, explain how it's planted. I mean, I think it's a head trained vineyard, uh, correct? In right, right. And I, right. So as a matter of fact, um, yeah, all that mixed black uh, talk and everything, and Morgan, uh, you know, his vineyard there up, up in Oakville, the one he's going to be representing, um, so this is, I'm sure people have seen things like this before, but it's just a, uh, a good illustration of how, um, how vineyards during that, that time period uh, were kind of planted. This is ours, you know, it's the Aldo's Vineyard. Um, every square represents a vine, and this is 6.09 acres, and each color represents uh, different varieties. So in Aldo's Vineyard, uh, we have nine different varieties, and that's kind of on the low end for these old vineyards. Um, you know, you know, Mike Officer has um, <laughs> has a vineyard. I don't know, like twenty eight different varieties. Um, so it, it, truly a mixed black. But the concept, and here's the illustration. It's just a good illustration of, of what that that can look like. And I um, I appreciated so many things of what Kelly was was talking about. Um, I. You know, as the growers uh, uh, kind of representing their site and during that period, not knowing exactly uh, what to plant and whatnot, uh, not very clearly, I, w I should say, but, but I'd like to kind of give, I'm a grower, so I'd like to kind of give the, the growers uh, at that time, maybe a little bit of credit of what they kind of thought would do well on their site in their district. You know, we're in the southern end of Napa Valley. It's a lot cooler than up in St. Lee and Calistoga, uh, where this Carignan uh, is coming from. And I think, I know, I think the growers knew that at the time, you know, and as they're tasting their grapes and tasting their neighbors and whatnot, what kind of uh, might do well? And here in our district, we have kind of a higher acid base, right? Uh, the, the, the wines are, and the grapes are a little bit more bright and brisk. So I thought, it, or I, I think that it's fairly interesting that the, the, the most widely other planted variety here in Aldo's is, the, so the black colored, right? Uh, as you can see, it's kind of demonstrated that it's most widely other planted uh, is something officially known as a Borio. We, we know it as early Burgundy and, and not really officially uh, connected to anything. It uh, doesn't look anything like a, a Pinot Noir. Um, it's southern France, and it's thick skin, kind of a medium-sized cluster, um, and extremely dark. 
But the interesting thing, the most fascinating thing is that it's a high pH. It's really, really soft. We've made it on its own just to, you know, figure out what is it. And, and that, that component right there mixed in with the kind of a higher acid uh, wine that, you know, Aldous would naturally give. And I still think it, it, it definitely still is kind of had this brisk, bright component to it. But I have to give the grower at the time a little bit of credit thinking that what would do well here as a good component, a good mix to this is a blend in uh, a, a softer, just to take the edge off that, that wine. And I'm, I'm just going to go with that. That's all there is to it. <laughs> and I, 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 uh, I really believe that. And, um, and, and fascinating, another thing fascinating at the time, because I remember it fairly well, is that in our area, we had lots of growers with early Burgundy. And as we moved, as you move up north, you would find less of it. And I think that's kind of fascinating, right? And so, and of course now it's mostly all gone. You know, the other thing I'd like to, uh, I kind of thought really interesting also uh, with Kelly, I love, you know, Napa's history and whatnot. And uh, one of the other factors I think that, um, that really changed uh, the modern Napa vision uh, when the, the, those other varieties started creeping in uh, other than those, those shipper. And that's the first time I heard that, um, that term. So thank you, Kelly, that's, uh, that's really, that's good. Um, you, you know, I, I think we have to also uh, uh, think that um, the judgment of Paris, because I remember it all so very, very well, is that, you know, those other varieties started coming into the 60s and they were doing well. Um, and at the time, honestly, growers were not making a lot of money. And that's just a fact. And I think, Tegan, you, you know all this. Uh, people know this. I mean, like my dad wasn't making a living on, on growing who, grapes. Who was he selling grapes to at that time? And at that time, it was the co-op. Okay. And yeah. the, the and, person and, that before that, who was it going to? Was it? Uh, Christian Brothers. Up on Christian Mount Brothers. Mount. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, growers just weren't making a lot of money. And when these new varieties started coming in, the prices started inching up a bit, but still, still not a lot. But as soon as the Judgment of Paris came along and we won both, both of those categories, it, it was the confidence that the wineries needed to then convince their growers to make that conversion. It was creeping along, but that like cemented it. It just accelerated from there and wineries then had confidence and they said, you know, convert these vineyards to these varieties now and we're going to pay you this much instead of this much. And the growers are going, fantastic. Of course, we're going to do that. And while that gave Napa its prominence and its new vision and, um, and now growers are making a living, uh, uh, there, there were people, um, my father being among, uh, among them, uh, and the Freddy Annies uh, uh, among them also, that just in some ways, in a, in a, not in a bad way, just kind of resisted that new vision, if you know what I mean. Uh, and, and not out of spite, it was just because they had this deep, deep love for what they had. And, and, that's, um, and, 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 and that's really, honestly, the only reason why this vineyard's still in the ground and the, uh, the few others in Napa Valley remain in the ground is that those growers honestly loved what they had. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, I think that's important to mention. And, uh, and thank God they're, you know, not, not all the growers converted because we wouldn't have any of these old vineyards um, and we wouldn't be able to taste the, the, the goodness from them. So, uh, so anyway, I, I just wanted to add that little. So tip. 1991, you, you decided right. to convince your dad to stop who were <laughs> right. you selling to a 90. Who were you, or who were you selling to in 91? Because you guys- Yeah, the, the co-op, the co-op. The co-op. And, and you know, it, it, took, it just took a, a couple of years not being paid by the co-op. So I know right. it, nothing, I, I, I didn't mean to even say that. Um, but it's it was, fair, no, I think, I think for, from a historical perspective, those things are very important because I think know, a lot of people that were loyal, even when they weren't being paid. Y yeah, and there's, there's the point. My, my dad uh, was extremely loyal. Um, some of that has rubbed off on me, but maybe not quite as much. 
um, and but the co-op served uh, a tremendous value in in Napa. It's during that time that Kelly was uh, uh, speaking of, um, there were lots of grapes being grown, and it they were being shipped out. But there was a period where there honestly there was uh, um, uh, maybe not enough to ship out, and the the growers needed a home. And so the, the co-op became uh, important. And the biggest, uh, the biggest purchaser at the time uh, was uh, the Gallo Winery. And so, the, uh, so, and at that time, I'm talking about, you know, 40s to 60s, up until the 70s, um, uh, Gallo purchased 100% uh, of the co-op juice. And at that time, um, uh, most of Napa was uh, Petit Syrah, Zinfandel, and like Kelly was saying, uh, Carignan, of course. Wasn't um, the Italian Swiss colony getting a bit of it too? I mean, sure I, it was. Sure I, it was. They were yeah. taking, they were kind of yes. the aloe of the time. Right. But 50% of Napa at the time went to the co op. Right. And, and the rest, you know, to individual wineries right. and Swiss colony, exactly. But the co op played a tremendous role in saving the vines. And uh, and saving kind of the industry, and and I and Gallo uh, was a big big part of that, and so I I give uh, tremendous credit to both of those organizations, but all things um, kind of change, and uh, and so the co-op's role uh, started to change with the new vision, and and it uh, and, and so it became a, a little less important. And, and it just, it, it lived its life and, and that's as simple as So that. how'd that conversation go with your father? In well, he didn't, like, he, he didn't like it, of course, at first, because, right. you know, uh, extremely loyal. It's like, you're, it's a marriage. And, right. and um, I, but I, I, I think I get this part from my mother <laughs> and it's like, you know, <laughs> it, at some point, you know, it's either, it's either working or it's not. And you, you, you just have to, you know, face it head on. And so that, um, along with, which I knew this was a little unfair because I knew his deep, other deep love was he wanted to do something on, a, on his own. I right. knew this. So I, you know, obviously I grew up with him and he had spoken about, you know, wouldn't it be nice someday to, you know, make our own wine and see what it'd be, what, what we could do with it. Um, not knowing that we would do 24 wines, you know, <laughs> later, but he was just talking about this one. So I knew that. And so he had this little dream, uh, you know, nestled deep down. And all I had to do was stir it. That's a little unfair, but. <laughs> and is there, I mean, 30 years on, is there another single vineyard Napa Zinfandel that's been made as long? I don't know if there is. Oh, well, you know, you mean as a single vineyard? Um, right. I, I, I was trying to think I, of it last night. And when I was kind of sketching some thoughts and I'm like, I don't Good. know if there's a single vineyard Napa Zinfandel that's made. Been wow. made. I mean, Haynes 93, but. Yeah, I was, cause I was going to say, cause you guys uh, came on in 93s. Um, I, good question, uh, Tegan. I, I mean, if not, I, I think it's a testament to what you and your family has done. And I think it's really neat and special that well, you know, thank a, a you. Of faith 30 years yeah. is still going strong. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, uh, when there is something good in the ground, um, why, why, uh, why change that? So Mr. Uh, Morgan Twain Peterson is saying Dickerson from Ravenswood, which I thought of, but I thought they also didn't take the grapes last year. So that kind of eliminates them uh, from, <laughs> from the conversation. Sorry, Morgan. He'll, I'm sure he'll text me something and he'll, he's muted right now, but I, I believe that, I believe that Constellation didn't, and I guess I could also equate that to a family owned winery, but uh, yes. So can you tell us a bit about the winemaking really quickly and the wine? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, since our mission um, has evolved to be only um, uh, Zinfandel, I shouldn't say only, you know, we make these tad bits and pieces of uh, you know, Barbera and Sangiovese, but you know, our real mission is Zinfandel. Um, and since we have so many of them, we have 15 different zins, uh, is that we really want the vineyards to speak, right? We, we hear about this all the time. And how do you, how do you allow uh, these vineyards to speak and have their voice? Uh, and, and 
in some ways it's, it's just very clear and common sense. We don't really uh, cover it um, with a, a bunch of other items such as new oak. So we do use a little bit of new oak. It's about 20, 25%, but it's the French uh, style. And I think all, you know, everyone probably recognizes that the, the species from France is a little tighter grained, a little, uh, a little more elegant than the American version. Not that one is better than the other. It's just that if our mission is to uh, really showcase all these vineyards, we need to find a vehicle and a vessel that will allow that to happen. And so um, that's what we do. Um, uh, we punch these down instead of pumping them over. Uh, and it's a, it, it's a standard kind of uh, fermentation process. Um, and it is gentle pressing. I know we talk about things like that, but we leave, we leave a lot back in, in, the, in the press. Um, we do, we get it, we get it down, but we don't take every, every piece of juice out of it, every drop. Um, there's just no need for it. So the wines remain fairly elegant. Um, and, um, we, so we have a question from the audience, Bob, can you tell us when the vineyard was planted? 1937. That's what I thought. Yep. So kind of at yeah. the end of prohibition and, uh, yeah, years right. out, out, out of prohibition. Yeah, yeah. So I thought it was, you know, th these vineyards in that era, I think, showed a little bit of confidence that things may come back, but they, uh, but knowing that there really wasn't a home, you know, probably, it, uh, it showed just a deep love also that these growers really, really wanted to um, continue farming and continue with something that they really loved. And, um, and so I think all of that is just so fascinating and important to, to why these are still on the ground. Um, uh, what else? Um, you know, yeah, those varieties that Kelly was speaking, right, are, are in here. It's really, it's really interesting, you know, like carrying on and whatnot. Although there's some obscure things like Mondeuse, uh, bits and pieces of that as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and Aldo's seems to age fairly, fairly well, uh, over time. We, you know, uh, we, we go back and we taste these things periodically. And, uh, and I, I, you know, it's all dependent. Some people appreciate older, older zins and whatnot. I happen to be one of them. My wife is not, <laughs> but she appreciates the freshness. Uh, but it's these other varieties in here that I think really allow these, helps allow these vineyards to age. Um, and really quickly, I'm gonna, move on in a second can you tell you about the wine that you and your dad made the whole cluster wine i love that. oh oh thanks for bringing that up right um uh mike's uh, comment and all that uh the whole cluster yeah so we, of, of course my, my dad's uh version growing up um with what he was uh known for as the black chicken and of course he uh that in those days of course that's all they did was throw the grapes in and whole cluster them and and that's how it was and it was a completely different style of wine, of course. Um, uh, so uh, just serendipitously in 2009, uh, our winemaker, Steve Hall, uh, uh, really wanted to bring back that version of wine. And so we, we dedicated uh, a, a whole lineup. Uh, we made a wine 100% uh, whole cluster and uh, we crushed it in his old crusher and punched it down with his punch down stick that his grandfather had carved, excuse me, his father had carved up on Mount Veter. And that, that is now hanging in the Smithsonian. And, uh, and we used all of those things. And it, I, I, well, and it, as it turns out, um, we were making that in October and he passed away in December. And I, I am now eternally grateful for Steve Hall, to Steve Hall, uh, for this, uh, his, this idea of his. Uh, and it was a beautiful wine. We still have a few magnums of it. And it's just gorgeous. It's aging really beautifully. Um, it tastes much different, but in a, in a very cool way, you know, yeah, for, those of, yeah, for those that have had these whole stemmed um, uh, wines, like this Carignan, um, it's gorgeous. I mean, man, uh, Michael, these are, thanks for bringing that uh, today. So anyway, we, uh, I, every time I see something like this, I, I, 
I want to, you know, resurrect that, that idea. Yep. So anyway. So, Thank so you, Bob. Good. Stay around. You're I'm welcome. sure people will have some questions for you. I'm going to sure do a quick rundown of the Turley Hain Vineyard Zinfandel. Uh, Rick, if you can maybe unmute Kelly and allow her to quiz me, but I'll give a quick rundown on the Hain Vineyard. So the Hain Vineyard uh, Zinfandel that you have, it's the 2018. Turley started making that wine in its inception in 1993. <clears throat> it's a vineyard that was planted by the Bourne family, a uh, <clears throat> pretty prominent family in the history of California own mines, also set up San Francisco's first water and electric uh, utility systems. They bought this property in, so this is just behind the high school in St. Helena, uh, very special soils. They bought this property in 1872, and the vines that we would get to work with today from the Zinfandel were planted in 1902 and 1903 is what we believe because we have harvest records from uh, 1905 that shows that they picked Zinfandel. So they had planted previously prior to that, but they uh, had phylloxera. So phylloxera hit the upper Napa Valley a lot later. Uh, it's a really special wine for the Tur Turley portfolio. You know, again, it's kind of in this hollowed ground of the Napa Valley. It's uh, Cortina soils. I know there have been a lot of people who this kind of stretch on the western uh, bench of Napa Valley, I think leading up from just north of the town of Yonkville, where Napa Nook is, all the way up past Spotswood. It's this really special place to grow grapes. You think of Ingle Nook and Tokalon and Kathy Corison's Vineyard and Spotswood and Hain and really neat place to grow grapes. And there are very few old vine vineyards left. So I, I feel really lucky and honored. It's a, it's a mixed vineyard like we've talked about, but the number two variety out in the vineyard is uh, Trousseau Noir. So it's Zinfandel, Trousseau Noir, Petit Syrah, Carignan, and there's a little bit of Flame Toquet out there as well. Um, it's a very early site for us. We usually pick it uh, in minus the last couple of years, I think nine times out of 22, we'd picked it in between September like 5th and September 8th. You know, it's a very consistent vineyard. The pHs and TAs are always about 3.55 to 3.65. Kelly, if you would like to badger me anything about the wine, feel free. If not, we can move on to the bedrock wine. Yeah, absolutely. So are you picking everything together, including the flame tokay and co-fermenting? We pick everything together. Unfortunately, if you've ever picked Old Vine Vineyards, the flame tokay usually never makes it back to the winery. You know, it's, it's usually consumed by the pickers before, you know, the day of harvest is over. You know, before Thompson or Flame Seedless, it was the number one table grape in America. And, you know, basically they, they engineered a grape to not have seeds that tasted, you know, not as amazing as uh, flame tokay and the rest is history. So there's definitely like a couple of clusters make it in, but also the pickers love, you know, and I always tell people, you know, when you see table grapes out in these old vine vineyards, you know, it was the Gatorade of the day. You know, there was none of this pick and finish everything by 10 a.m., before in harvest, before we luckily had these amazing crews uh, that work extremely hard, uh, people have worked hard as well, but they picked from daybreak till the end of the day, you know, and not worrying about, you know, the condition of the grapes as much as we do now. So, I mean, that's definitely something, most things were picked into wooden lug boxes. Actually, Professor Bioletti in one of his reviews when they were having problems with uh, volatile acidity, he came out with the recommendation that when you picked grapes all day, you actually didn't crush them that day. You left them in the wooden boxes out in the field. And at daybreak or right before daybreak, you'd come back and gather them. So when you brought them to the winery to crush them, they were actually at like 55 degrees. When you brought them at 5 p.m. and they were, you know, 85 degrees, you kind of would be dealing with a, a freight train of a fermentation. So um, I'm guessing that there was a time that the Hain grapes were left out in the field overnight, which just 
you know, to any winemaker, you can't really imagine, you know, someone doing that. So. Can you talk a little bit about how you make the wine, how you treat it in the cellar? So we treat it in the cellar. We, we, it's uninoculated, unfined, unfiltered. You know, we basically bring it in cold and we destem it and we, you know, pump it over once a day until it starts fermenting on its own. And, you know, the Hain is the only Zinfandel that we will give some serious extended maceration to. So usually it's 30 days in tank. And, you know, you'll see that there's structure in it. You know, that neck of the woods, I think, is known for two things, kind of perfume and structure. Not unlike Pickett Road, it's just kind of a different area. I think you'll see in Rosemary's wine, to me, her wine is like, it's that area. Like, you, you kind of morph the grape variety, and it doesn't matter if it's Cabernet or Petite Syrah, it's that upper Napa Valley gravel, you know, sulfur, spree, sulfur creek kind of... Uh, you know, outflow. But uh, yeah, so we put it into 20% new French oak and we rack it maybe once and, you know, bottle it. So what you had mentioned, this is the only wine you really give extended maceration to. Is it because of that structure or is it another reason? It's because of that structure. You know, it's got that, you know, acid tannin synergy where I think this wine is, you know, three, five, two finished pH, you know, and it's almost 16% alcohol. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, we're always picking it early. So, I mean, it's, you know, we've picked it, you know, early August. I mean, we picked it a couple times in August, but it's usually, you know, Labor Day weekend we're harvesting hay. So. You and I have talked in the past about how you, in your experience, um, maybe contrary to conventional thinking that dry farmed old vine vineyards tend to perform better in extreme weather conditions. Yes. Uh, can you expound upon that a little bit? Well, one, I, I think the easiest explanation is they've, they've, they've seen it before, you know, and that they're not reliant on some superficial root zone that is developed under a drip ear emitter. Most of these vineyards are historically cross cultivated. So when you have a bush vine in the middle, you drive a tractor both ways. And I think the biggest thing that does is it it root it prunes the root zone. So you're basically forcing the sub the surface roots. You're pruning them off with the tractor disc or the spader or the cultivator or some type of plow, and you're forcing the roots to go down further. When you string up a drip irrigation line, and I always liken it, and we do have irrigated vineyards, but to fish coming to a fish tank feeding where they come up to the top of the surface. And I think roots do that. I'm, I'm being dramatic when I explain it that way. But the thing is, you can't cultivate that zone anymore because you have a, a drip line. So even in vineyards that have been converted to irrigation, when you can't cultivate that, you have roots that kind of, you know, focus in one specific section of the vine row. And I think that makes them you know, more inclined to react to climate change and climate changes in the climate specific to the year very differently. You know, they're, they're, I, you could almost say that they're more in tuned with the, you know, the direct climate that they're experiencing, irrigated vineyards, especially in the Mediterranean climate, which you touched on. Uh, you know, you have you know, if it dries out, that little root zone dries out, those vines need water. If the roots are deeper, they don't really notice the dry out the same way. Uh, and I think, you know, with irrigation, we all know that we can encourage growth of a vine and kind of allow a vine to bite off more than it can chew. When the vines are dry farmed, you know, they more or less self-regulate. There's very few times that old vines have set a crop level that they can't bring to harvest. Zinfandel, I think, also has a little bit of a bad reputation and I think is misunderstood um, in consumer circles. And I know you really beat the drum for talking about that it actually has a very high natural acidity. And also you take a very transparent approach uh, to its, its alcohol levels and um, which has to do with the kind of unusual ripening patterns of the grape. Can you talk a little bit about the acidity and the way that Zinfandel ripens um, and alcohol levels? Well, I think we all know that Zinfandel doesn't, most people know that Zinfandel historically does not ripen evenly. The cluster doesn't ripen evenly. 
And what we mean by that is you'll have green shop berry, you'll have regular uh, looking berries, you'll have some sorts of raisination to hard raisins on a cluster. Earlier on, when I was really fascinated with it at Turley, when things were harvested, I would strip all the berries off clusters and I'd put them through, you know, squeeze each of them and wipe off a refractometer. And I remember when we picked it, you know, this vineyard was picked around 25 bricks and, you know, clearly there's a soak up, but my, my range of clusters back then would be 19 to like 31 bricks, you know, to get 25 bricks of Zinfandel, you had this range of basically, you know, up to 31 and down to 19 on the same cluster. And I think that's where you get a lot of the complexity of Zinfandel. I think, uh, the acidity at Zinfandel is why it persisted in California viticulture. You know, there people did attempt Pinot Noir and Cabernet, but I think one thing that wasn't mentioned, those varieties that aren't from the Mediterranean really started to take off once we had modern refrigeration and winemaking techniques and cellar. Uh, I know I've read some notes from Andre Chelichev when he came to BV and he said, the white wines were horrible. The red wines were really bad. The Zinfandel was okay, and he hated Zinfandel, allegedly. And then he said, but the fortifieds were really good. And I thought, okay, Zinfandel has its own with its acid and alcohol has a bit of its own fortification. And, you know, I think the sellers were in the 90s at BV when he first came. You know, the first summer, the sellers were up to 90 degrees with wine in there. So I think one of the reasons Zinfandel has been able to persist, persist is that you know, it did have, you know, high alcohol and uh, higher alcohol, not high, not as high as we make them today, but it also had very high acidity. So, yeah. well, thank you. Thank you. I think we, for time's sake, I think I need to move on to Mr. Morgan Twain Peterson, MW. Can we uh, unmute him, please? I am unmuted. Okay, Morgan. Prepare so yourself, Tegan. What's that? said, prepare yourself to prepare myself. Uh -oh. <laughs> He's unmuted. Uh, so. so Morgan, tell us about, I, I kind of explained your, you know, your journey into wine and making wine. And, you know, there was some chat going on about, you know, your dad's a Sonoma guy, but he did make arguably the longest lived <laughs> Napa Zinfandel. Unfortunately, Ravenswood did not take those grapes, just to correct everyone, this last year. So the rain has ended with, uh, with uh, uh, Ravenswood Dickerson. Yeah. But what brought you over to the Napa Valley? I mean, you know, you, what's this vineyard? So you've got an old vineyard and it's next to some, you know, quasi-famous vineyards in Oakville? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, honestly, uh... I mean, uh, my dad started working with Dickerson, I think, in 1982, um, and he actually got the fruit last year for his new brand, uh, Once in Future, so there will be continuity there, but um, unfortunately, Ravenswood's uh, time came to an end in 2019, um, and I have incredibly fond memories of um, going and driving through Napa Valley as a kid because the the route that we would take is started Sonoma, work our way up to Dickerson. I always got to have Orangina at Oakville Grocery when it was still a little roadside dusty stand. And then we would work our way up to Knights Valley and then look at vineyards in Dry Creek and Russian River Valley and work our way back down to Sonoma. So that was the route that I would do with my, with my dad and his old Peugeot 505 Turbo in the 80s. Um, and uh, so, you know, I've, I've always, I've always adored it. And obviously I've been able to walk Kane and my dad worked with Frediani and Luvisi and um, vineyards up in Calistoga as well for, and, and Czechs. And um, so I, it's always been there. Um, uh, Oakville Farmhouse though, it really just came to us um, out of happenstance. So um, actually Tegan, it was you who introduced me to the Casa Nuestra wines. Um, in the 90s and the 2000s. And so the Oakville farmhouse property was originally owned by the Kirkhams um, who owned Costa Nuestra. And I, I just adored that winery and uh, it would always make, you know, made such incredible like old Chenin Blanc and Riesling. And, um, and unfortunately in 2012, they sold the property. Um, and the, but the new owners happened to be uh, friends with a, a mutual friend of mine. And can you didn't paint really the know picture what... for us to where the vineyard's located, just to give everyone kind of a 
Yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, I didn't even know it was there. And the first time I, I arrived, it's pretty stunning. So it's literally under Promontory in Harlan. And it's across the street in the back of the Farniente Vineyards. And it's kind of catty corner to uh, the old monastery on the edge of Tokalon. So um, it's in a uh, pretty incredible uh, dirt. And it's surrounded by some very, very uh, illustrious neighbors. Um, so it's pretty incredible when you see this little scraggly eight by eight, two and a half acre uh, vineyard still still surviving there. Um, but, you know, I, I was called into the vineyard in 2013 um, by the new owners. Um, and basically, they didn't really know what they wanted to do with the vineyard, whether, you know, obviously with new owners in Napa, the first tendency is to, you know, tear out the old vines and plant Cabernet, particularly given the fact that you are in that neighborhood. Um, but I kind of begged them if I could just map the vineyard so we could figure out what was there. And so um, in 2013, I, I mapped it. Um, there's a bunch of varieties we couldn't ID. So um, like with all of our old vineyards, we worked with uh, foundation plant services and did PCR analysis on some of the old varieties um, and came up with some really fascinating things, which I can, which I can get into. But um, luckily, I made a, 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 a desperate plea and appeal to the uh, new owners, and they actually thought it was really, really cool that they had something so unique, um, and they have become really strong supporters of, of the vineyard, and um, I really give that a huge commendation because it is an incredibly unique wine, and it really um, has varieties, and it's a real, um, it's a, it's a, a rundown of the what old, old yeah, it's a real vision into what like old Napa vineyards look like. So, um, you know, I think uh, before I jump right into the varieties, I think it's worth uh, talking about, and it goes back to what Kelly was saying, um, that, you know, phylloxera hit California in the late 1870s. And in 1880 and 1881, the uh, state created the State Board of Viticultural Commissioners, which was really tasked with trying to figure out how they were going to combat phylloxera, but then also the state saw a huge opportunity because phylloxera was worldwide. So worldwide stocks of wine were dropping massively. So the state of California saw this as an opportunity to actually better position California wine um, in the global market. And it is pretty amazing when you see how far across the world California wines are actually being tasted in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, and you know, with that, there was this real movement to move away from mission grapes um, into higher quality vinifera varieties. And so Charles Wetmore, who was one of the viticultural commissioners from Livermore, um, basically said that in 1880, he estimated that 90% of the state vineyards were planted to mission. And by 1890, 80% of the state vineyards were planted to higher quality vinifera varieties. So there's a huge sea change in the way that vineyards looked in California during the 1880s. And part of this was promulgated by nurserymen who would go back um, to the old world and bring back all sorts of different cuttings and were trying to figure out what would work. Um, there's several famous ones around the state. Probably the most famous in Napa was Hamilton Walker Crab or H.W. Crab, who is the owner of Tokolon Vineyard. Um, and at one point in the late, by 1890, it was estimated that he was growing over 300 different varieties at Tokolon, which is kind of amazing when you think that Tokolon is become pretty close to a Cabernet monoculture at this point. Um, Give he us had some a, reference to how close Tokolon is, just to explain to folks where Tokolon is related to your vineyard. My high school baseball self could throw a baseball and hit it. Mm. Uh, my, <laughs> my current <laughs> baseball self, probably not. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's close. And also when you talk about, um, you know, the historic boundaries of Tokolon, which obviously has gotten much you know, there's it depending on where you are, it's depending on what map you're looking at, it's very, very close. Um, and so, what's really interesting is, you know, back in the day, people were giving different names to grapes. Um, and H.W. Crab had his uh, preferred grape, which he called Crab's Black Burgundy. Um, and sort of through the permutations of history, we now have known that H.W. Uh, that Crab's Black Burgundy is what people call Rafasco or Mondus. Um, in fact, when you do DNA analysis at Davis and you take samples, they literally say Mondus, also known as AKA Rafasco, which is a little misleading, but um, uh, what's really amazing at Oakville Farmhouse is one of the prominent varieties there is uh, Mondus uh, or Rafasco. So it's pretty much the oldest, I mean, I think Aldo's has some too, 
but um, the oldest plantings of, you know, Hamilton Walker crabs uh, preferred grape variety, um, which is which is quite cool. The vineyard itself has 17 different interplanted varieties. Um, in order of importance, the, actually the number one is a variety called Negret, which is originally from the Côte de Frontenay in France, but it was known as Pinot St. George in California for a very long time. Um, and then after that, it's Petit Syrah, um, uh, Zinfandel, uh, Mondeuz, uh, Carignan, uh, and then there's actually Chenin Blanc, Colombard, uh, Malvasia Bianca, uh, Semillon, uh, and a number of others, and uh, five Muscat Homburg vines, which also uh, go away the day before harvest because <laughs> um, they're delicious. Um, so it's a really, really interesting wine. And what I've always found so amazing about it is um, despite the fact that it's got these crazy varieties, it has zero Cabernet in it, um, the wine just reeks of Oakville to me. It almost, you know, it smells like it's got cassis, it's got the dust, it's got, you know, um, one of my favorite things to do is to, um, you know, when we when we have these wines with the McDonald brothers who had their old vines in Tokelon, and you see the wines side by side, there's it's crazy because I feel like you see more kinship in the wines uh, than you do, um, despite the fact that they're completely different varieties. Very cool. Uh, I think we should move on uh, mm -hmm. to Rosemary, and I'd like to come back to Morgan if we have time. Uh, I want a little info on the Historic Vineyard Society, but I think we should move on to <laughs> Rosemary and uh, come back after we're, we're, if we can unmute uh, Rosemary, that'd be great. Unmuted. Unmuted Rosemary, thank you for joining us. Uh, I love your wine, it's beautiful. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, it's now part of the Gallica estate, correct? Sure. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so um, I've been uh, living in, and working and making wine from this little corner of St. Helena, the southwestern corner. Um, you know, we're just north of Hain. We're right off of Sulphur Creek on this Cortina, this strip of Cortina soil um, for over 30 years now. And so um, when I came here, um, Bruce and I bought some property. We were in our mid twenties. We planted in 1990, we planted a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon clone four on, on 110 R. And we were really young and we were so enthusiastic and we didn't know we were constantly learning. The neighbor next door to us, Matt and Jane St. George were living on this Petit Syrah vineyard. And Matt was a, uh, an engineer, a retired en airline engineer, and a do-it-yourselfer, built his own house and farmed this little bit of Petit Syrah, made, made homemade wine for a while, and then also sold fruit subsequently as he aged to Kent Rosenblum and, um, and then uh, uh, subsequently to Dave Finney. Um, we were able to purchase the property from Matt and Jane's five kids nine years ago. So I feel like I'm a student to Petit Syrah um, because I've made mostly other, mostly um, for so many years, Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc. But in working with Spotswood, one of the things that is so memorable to me is we, we worked with uh, the Frediani family. We purchased fruit for a number of years from, um, from Jean and Jim. And I loved going up there and walking those vineyards. I learned so much. And then also from Pauline and Vince Toffinelli because we purchased Old Semillon on Dunaweel Lane. And so there was a 10 year history. And one of the things I really learned about um, old vines then was, I made wines from those grapes from in 1998 and 99 when it was super cool and then moving into those very warm years of 2003 and four. And one of the things that was so notable to me was how um, comfortable those vines were in those soils. They really didn't, they, they were, they didn't really, they just responded really well to the, to whatever mother nature threw at them. And the wines were very, very um, consistent throughout those years. And I, I really walked away learning a lot from, from that experience. And then I, uh, you know, um, conversely, then we were able to purchase this property, the Petit Syrah, and all those things kind of came back to me. Um, and now I'm really inspired by listening to all of you guys today, because one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is climate change. 
and working with Petit Syrah on, on these, these very old vines that were planted somewhere about 1953, we think. Um, there's still many of them really healthy. We've had to replanting ones that are, um, that are not making it. Um, but um, it's, it's amazing to me how consistent the pr great producers still and the wines are beautiful. Um, and so it's been a real privilege to, um, to work with this block. And so it's become an obsession with mine now, no matter what it costs, we're like, we're out there doing whatever it takes to, to make it happen. Um, and so um, that's kind of the story of the, um, of, you know, our, our really early introduction to this vineyard. Cause I said, it's only been about nine years now that we've been working with the fruit. And how big is the block? It's only an acre. And, um, and it's interplanted, there's Petit Syrah, but there is um, Alicante out there and there's Carignan out there for sure. Um, and so it's primarily Petit Syrah, but there really is some, we have it mapped out, but there are other varieties out there. And there are a number of other little old vine vineyards on that stretch of the street, right? There it's are. To see. And, and I suspect at one time it was one massive vineyard and then um, over time it was sort of subdivided um, and I wish I knew more about the history. We've, we've asked a lot of neighbors and they just, you know, it was some Italian guy, but he's no longer in the area. And so we don't really know much um, about the, you know, the genesis of the vineyards. Um, but having said that, I feel really comfortable in this area because we've been, you know, here um, since 1986 and, and making wine since um, the early 90s from, from this property. And what can you tell us? I mean, I, I, I think the wine showing really beautifully. And I mean, I think to me, it, it represents everything about that northern part of those Cortina soils. I mean, with your experience at Spotswood and with your own vineyard there, can you kind of run us through what you see as the, the, the trademarks of that part of, you know, western St. Helena and those gravel soils? Sure. Um, I think I think maybe Morgan, you you alluded to this. When when I show people this wine, often without seeing the label, they honestly don't know what it is. Um, you know, is it Cabernet? Could it be Cabernet? Is it an older Cabernet? And I'm I've been really surprised too. I think that the wines they're very simply made. Um, it's, you know, it, it really only spends about seven days on the skin. It's completely de stem but no rollers, just whole berries, only one punch down a day. We really don't work the wines very much at all and early pressing and neutral barrels and even a little bit of stainless steel. I really don't want, um, I don't want the alcohols to be high. So I've been experimenting not just with Petit Syrah but with other varieties and putting some red wine into stainless and trying to mitigate the alcohols. Cause all, even we all know in the best of sellers, we still get alcohol creep. And so I've been working with that, um, but it's very simply made and uh, maybe anywhere between usually 13, 14 months in barrel and bottled and no finding, no filtration. There's so little of it. I mean, we make like one or two barrels a year. Um, well, thank you for sharing it with us. It's fantastic. So, well, thanks. Thanks for including me. I, I mean, I love the the purity, the aromatics. I mean, again, it to me reminds me of just that neck of the woods of Napa Valley, you know, and um, it's a really special wine. No, oh, thanks. Well, if we have a couple minutes, uh, first, before we take any questions, and there have been a couple, a few, uh, Mr. Morgan Twain Peterson, can you give us a quick elevator pitch on the Historic Vineyard Society. <laughs> um, sure, I will do my best. Um, so basically, uh, <clears throat> I feel like I'm going to be great because Tegan's on the board with me. So uh, <laughs> he's throwing me on the spot. Um, so uh, the Historic Vineyard Society uh, was created basically because we realized that we were losing a lot of old vineyards. Um, and we realized that we'd never really documented or had an idea of how many old vineyards there were. So we knew we were losing this incredible resource in, uh, you know, in California, but we didn't really know how much of it we were losing. And I think the main idea was to um, basically become an advocacy group where we could actually create and provide information about these old vineyards, create a registry of them, 
um, and also just uh, and have a spot where people can really engage and, and, and see and learn more about them. Um, so, you know, over the last, God, it's almost been a decade now, uh, Tegan, Bob is on the board with us as well, Mike Officer from Carlisle, um, and David Gates from Ridge. Um, you know, we have been able to put together vineyard tours where people are really able to get boots on the ground. In fact, we did a great one in Napa um, where people were able to see, um, I believe it was uh, Old Craft Vineyard, Bob, of yeah, yours, and then it Hain, was right. um, and, in the uh, same neck of the woods that we were just talking about, Rosemary's Vineyard and yeah, and all, all the all the pain and yeah. So not and so really just um, looking at these old vineyards and you know old vines are under threat all over the state. So the other thing too is really um, looking at old vineyards in Lodi and Amador County and Mendocino and Santa Clara and Paso Robles and Cienega Valley and these you know uh, in in Napa the the great threat to old vineyards is is Cabernet. Um, in Lodi, it's the cost of labor and the fact that everything is being um, automated now. And in Contra Costa County, it's housing tracks because BART is extending eastward to Stockton and all of a sudden vineyard land that has been there for 120 years is now selling for $200,000 an acre to developers. So, um, you know, the, the idea is that we can basically allow people to really engage um, and, uh, you know, learn more about these um, incredible old vineyards, uh, both in Napa, but also in areas more, uh, you know, to the exterior parts of the state. Well said. Thank you very much. And I'm going to answer a couple questions that people have uh, put in the chat really quickly. So I'm going to uh, start at the top. And so Jen Lamb asks, when a vine dies, are they replanted with the same rootstock and clone? Uh, we, we've done some extensive DNA testing. Uh, and I think we, we continue to, when we have an unknown, we DNA test uh, <clears throat> with the Historic Vineyard Society and Morgan and Mike Officer. And uh, we do use the same selection if we know that it's clean historically. Uh, and then... Uh, someone asked about Ravens when Dickerson is still the longest hashtag was the longest. Uh, <laughs> and then I think most people have touched on when the vineyards were planted and someone asked uh, punch down versus pump hours and how it shows in the wine. Maybe we'll let someone take that on. Jen also asked, so the D is a under uh, lowercase D it's not a P and uh, the petite is not on spring street. That's a Phil Hicks question. Uh, Christina asked what the uh, the price of the wines were, and we can go through those. And then Brian Teef, do we know the oldest vineyard still in commercial production? And yet I, it's believed to be the Deaver Mission Vineyard in Amador County planted in 1854. Uh, and to answer Christina's question, if I can go through all of the... Uh, so I think Mike Herbie, your wine, was it $30? Uh, yeah, thirty dollars. Okay, and and Bob, what what is Aldo's? Eighty five. Eighty five, and the Turley is seventy five, and Morgan. Uh, uh, seventy five. Seventy five, and Rosemary. Uh, sixty. Sixty. So I know it might sound like a lot, but as we know in Napa Valley, those are still seen viewed as like great values. Uh, Someone said, to what extent has UC Davis had import in the Napa Valley? Uh, well, I can tell you that they are probably the most important university with what we're dealing with now, which is, you know, red blotch and uh, vine diseases, and they continue to spearhead that. And, you know, they've spearheaded, you know, a lot of uh, technology and research base for, uh, for the industry as a whole, I mean, even when you travel to France and Italy and, you know, they, uh, you know, they talk about, so I'm going to throw it out to Bob Bialy. Christopher Vandergrees asked, what flavors would you say you get in old vines compared to younger vines of the same clone variety? Can you answer that for us, Bob? Um, well, in general, um, the, the young vines, uh, are really more exuberant in their in their in their showing. 
Um, and, and it's not so much the flavor, in my opinion, as opposed to just so much more, I would say maybe monotone, a monotone flavor. Um, and the sight not necessarily coming through as, uh, as, ex as expressively as an older vine. Um, and and I, so it's not so much flavor. I think the flavors come through, you know, where, where it's being grown, of course, if it's up valley, down valley, hillside, um, valley floor. I think that has a lot to do with the flavors, of course. Um, but it's, uh, it's more the range of flavors. And the older the vine, we're, we're finding that uh, they just have just a, a, a much more uh, concentration and a much more diverse. And I, and I don't think it's all, all to, you know, uh, it's not all about, I don't, I don't think it's just the cause of these uh, other varieties in here. It's um, what Tegan was talking about earlier, uh, about how far these roots are really going down. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with expressing the site itself. Um, so the longer the vine has been in that site, the deeper the roots are probably going, uh, really searching for that, that water table and the moisture and just collectively tasting and gathering and bringing up to the surface and into the grapes themselves, all these beautiful nutrients and the minerality that I think most of these old vineyards are known for. Uh, and so, and, and when and we do, um, and I think it's a really good example, uh, we have taken these, uh, some of these older clones, of course, and we have them right on our own property here. One of them is the R.W. Moore, uh, which Tegan would recognize as um, the 19, uh, you called it 1906. You called it the Moore earthquake. Moore, Moore earthquake, right. So uh, Bill Moore, uh, we now uh, are producing that. And, and so when we compare our bottling of R.W. Moore with our uh, block here on the winery, and again, this, the soils are, are a little bit different. We're about two miles away. <clears throat> But I tell you, uh, the, it's so, while we love the one here on, on the ranch here, we, we really do love it. It is so singular in its, uh, in its profile, um, as opposed to the RW, which is this expressive, broad, uh, really uh, lovely. Um, so there you have, I think it's, it's more of that. Well, and I remember asking when I was young, for the first time in Burgundy and I was kind of questioning the producer about clones and selections and they just kind of turned to me at one point and they said you know clones is a young vine conversation you know that when you are working with clonal selections it makes a lot of difference in the early life of a vineyard but once you know a vineyard reaches a certain age maybe 25 30 years it starts to become less of the conversation and that that's yeah. kind of always stuck with me. Okay, I think that's a, a perfect way to say it. That's how I should have said it. <laughs> um, but I think the idea is the same. And uh, I would agree 100% with that. Uh, and I think, not to interject, I think that at any vineyards we see where we have young vines and old vines side by side, I just think young vines express the site typicity, but I almost feel like they're the light beer equivalent. Like they just don't quite have the the same level of density um and the chemistries are also they can be a little different as well yeah yeah i would definitely say the chemistry and this i've always said the wine seem to be more stable when we still separate like in the hain vineyard we still separate the 1997 plantings out from the 1902 plantings and <laughs> the wines in the in the cellar you know when you have them in the cellar are very different it's kind of yeah. You know, unfortunately, I, I feel like the 1902 vines have a lead in a race that I don't know if the 97 vines can catch up with, you know, in my lifetime. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the way, one of the ways I look at that. We work with two vineyards close to each other in Paso and one's 1885 and one's 1923. And everyone says, why does the 1885 always have so much more density? And I'm like, it is, you know, 40 years older. And people kind of laugh at that. And I don't know if that's a, a good answer or not, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I always, you know, I think it's a good answer. <laughs> I, I think of uh, when I was a kid during the 86 flood, 
uh, I remember we lived downtown and we had a family friend. We were going around in a boat checking on people. And I don't know if you remember Gene Traverso. Do you remember Gene, who yeah. was a butcher at uh, Jevanoni's? Right. He was in a wheelchair on his uh, on his porch, and he had been around the last two major floods. And we kind of went with the boat up to his porch, and we were asking him, and he said, "Oh, in this flood, I I was you know I was uh, nine years old, you know, and he was like, in this flood in 1902 or whatever, in this flood." And I, I, it always stuck with me how grounded this person who had lived, you know, within a block, you know, his whole life in his nineties, how wow. truly rooted he was. And I, I, I have a hard time not feeling the same way about, you know, vines and people who, you know, when you, when you have the privilege of meeting someone who they, you know, a lot of people kind of pass them by and don't think they're the most interesting, but they can tell you every nook and cranny, every little story of an area. And I think that's what we're seeing from these old vine vineyards. They're telling us about every nook and cranny of Oakville and Oak Knoll and St. Helena. And, you know, in a way that modern vineyards might not have the ability to, no matter how hard they try. Yeah, yeah, well said. Uh, and on that irrigation thing, you know, we've we've created a generation, uh, two generations, three generations of thirsty vines. Um, and but although I, I, I've actually personally seen lots of uh, vineyard managers recommending more drought tolerant um, rootstock now. Right. And so I, I really applaud that. Um, and certain varieties do do better on other varieties, of course, I mean, uh, on rootstock, but um, in general, I think there's going to be a little bit of a trend uh, moving back towards some of these drought tolerant um, rootstock. And, um, and I know also uh, part of the, the thing is non tilling, but uh, your, your explanation, I think Tegan was like right on the money, um, you know, uh, cutting off those, those surface roots uh, really make a tremendous difference in difference in uh, allowing these vines to really search for their their own irrigation although these new although these new rootstocks i mean as, as we know they're not designed to go much further right. than about six feet uh so we're kind of uh, they'd have to be totally changed out um but I, I see a good future with these uh with the with napa in particular um i don't think we're as kind of limited in our scope any longer uh there's a lot of new, uh, a lot of new discussion coming into the play with the, the, the younger uh, vineyard managers and winemakers and whatnot. And I, I really appreciate that because we're kind of making a, a full circle. It's not going to happen overnight and it won't be complete, but um, it will be in the mix again. And I think that's an important part. So. No, I think uh, discussion is one of the things that, you know, I mean, here we are having a discussion about old vines and, you know, what they represent in Napa Valley. And if I can, I, I will find uh, something that was written. Please, if anyone else has something to add on, on the subject, please uh, join in. But I, I did want to finish with one thing that uh, Bob really reminded me of. And um, I will... If you can just hold on for one second or talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I know we're, we're, we're dwindling here, but it is, it's, it's so important to what you just. Uh, well, while you're doing that, I was going to answer uh, Jennifer Lamb's question of, are you starting your own nursery with these older clones? And um, <clears throat> actually with historic vineyard society, we're really excited because We've been working with Foundation Plant Services at Davis to take selections from these older vineyards, get them cleaned up, and um, eventually make them available uh, to the public. So not only were, like Zap has done an incredible job of creating some uh, great Zinfandel clonal material, but we're also going to have <clears throat> things like Cabernet Sauvignon from 1888 that was planted wow. at Bedrock Vineyard, things like Saint Macaire, um, uh, Trousseau, very old selections of Syrah that <clears throat> isolated from the 1880s. Um, so, you know, these sort of California selection biotypes, which should be 
kind of cool because, you know, when we are planting Syrah, a lot of times we're looking at NTAB clones, we're looking at things that were developed for different uh, climates that are not California. So um, uh, the very first cuttings from these are um, coming up the vine, coming up pretty much this year. So um, oh, that's great. in process. Yeah. Wow. That's exciting. So, for you. <laughs> I want to read. So at the 1858 uh, California Agricultural Convention in uh, California, the on Honorable Samuel B. Bell of Alameda, which actually a lot of people don't know that the first University of California pre-Berkeley was actually in Alameda before, but he he gave uh, a speech, you know, the annual address, and it was about based on agriculture and, and he's the, 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 the tidbit from his address that I love the most. He said, without agriculture, there's no enlightenment. <clears throat> For we must have collision of intellects or there's no thought. We must compare or there are no ideas. No ideas awake, but by comparison, we must inspect, collate, debate, emulate, compete, rival, carry off premiums, the very disputes, contentions, quarrels, if you will, inherent to the very nature of such societies are absolute essentials to progress. And, you know, I kind of think that it, it's something that's so important to what we're doing. I don't think any of us bemoan the progress of Napa Valley, but we can also, you know, revel in its past. So. Uh, well said there, Tegan. Well, aren't any more questions? I think. I would like to thank everyone. I don't know if uh, Diana or anyone else from the Wine Library would like to say a few things, but I think we're all wrapped up. Thank you all for staying almost two hours on a really great Saturday. Thank you all to the panelists who have taken part, to the moderator and the keynote speaker. We're most appreciative of how generous you've been with your wine, your knowledge, your energy, your patience. And for all of those attending, the next event is in June with a conversation between a young and an old winemaker, um, which is to say experienced and coming along in perspectives, which is at, in a Thursday evening, June 17th, I believe at 6.30. Thank you all for what I hope is a breaking wave. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Diane, thank you. Yeah. It was a pleasure being with everybody today. Thanks. All righty, thank you all. Uh, take care, have a good Saturday. Yeah. Thanks uh, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, very well.